Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the, this year's Faraday Lecture. And um, so just a few words of introduction to the lecture and then uh, today's speaker. So first of all, you know, we've, many scientists have long recognized the importance of uh, pub public engagement and communicating ideas to the public. Uh, I think it's important for a variety of reasons, but I think the most important thing is that science really is part of our culture. It's part of the triumph of humanity that we've been able to figure out all of these secrets about the world and the universe around us. And so it's important really to share that, to share our knowledge uh, in ways that are accessible uh, to uh, people in general. And that leads to Michael Faraday, who uh, I'm sure, as to me, he was a hero uh, in many respects. I, I mean, I learned, first knew about him when I was growing up in India. And I always thought it was amazing that someone from a working class background who never finished high school, as far as I know, could uh, go on to become one of the top scientists uh, in, in, of his time, not just in Britain. And uh, to some extent, that shows the openness, uh, certainly of British science. In Victorian times, here was this guy, you know, had never been to, uh, high, never finished high school, and was simply recognized for uh, his talent. And of course, he made contributions to a variety of fields, you know, from electromagnetism to chemistry to uh, all kinds of things. And so he's a great scientist, a self-made man, but the other important thing was he was also a great expositor of science. And in fact, we still remember that he gave, you know, he started a tradition uh, with the Christmas lectures at the Royal Institution. And you know, there's a very famous portrait of him, um, you know, giving uh, one of the first Christmas lectures. So it's in his honor that this lecture to, uh, you know, promote public understanding of science uh, has been named. So that leads to uh, today's lecture, lecturer, Kathy Willis, uh, who's the winner of this year's Faraday Lecture uh, Award. And uh, I should tell you, uh, we're in for a treat today, but I'll, I'll tell you why a bit later. Uh, but first, uh, a little bit about her. She got her P uh, bachelor's degree from Southampton and then did both her PhD and postdoc in Cambridge, where she spent uh, quite a large number of years. Uh, and then she went to Oxford, where she established uh, a long-term ecology lab and where uh, she continues to be a professor. And uh, she was also appointed uh, more recently as the director of science at the Royal Botanical Gardens at Kew. And uh, this led to an interesting conversation I had with her about how to manage being in two places uh, at once. Anyway, um, <clears throat> and still keeping your research going, that's what I meant. Um, she's published a number of leading uh, papers. Um, she's particularly interested on, on the response of ecosystems to environmental changes, especially long-term uh, effects. And she's been recognized uh, for her work by a number of um, uh, fellowships, for example, the Fellow of the Geological Society and the uh, Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters. So why is it that she's the Faraday lecture. Well, she's already shown that she's a superb communicator of science to the general public, uh, because many of you may have uh, listened to her Radio 4 broadcasts called uh, From Roots to Riches. There were a whole series of 15-minute talks that were then combined into, I think, five uh, omnibus uh, editions. And I have to say, I started listening to them. Um, initially, I wanted to just you know, get a feel for what she had done. But then I, I was essentially drawn into them because they're totally fascinating. They're about how we started to know about plants, how we started to classify them, how we thought of plants as growing in their particular environment, what happened when you changed environments. And also, it was a swashbuckling adventure story. There were people who were, you know, going into the jungles of the Amazon and on the Endeavor and all sorts of things. And people are actually kind of crooks in a way, stealing things from different places and, and, and transporting them to different places, you know, uh, quinoa from South America or, you know, rubber from South America and going, ending up in, 
uh, Malaysia all through uh, Kew Gardens and, and the sort of these powerful personalities that were uh, behind a lot of this stuff. So it's a fascinating series, and if you haven't seen it, um, I highly recommend it. Uh, but I don't recommend that you listen to it at the end of a long day just before you're going to sleep because she does have a very soothing voice that I've become very, <laughs> that I've become very familiar with. And um, so I recommend that you perhaps listen to it just before you have dinner rather than after. And, um, and so um, without further ado, today's talk will be on genes to beans, uh, polyploidy on a plate. So, thank you very much, and I hope my voice isn't too soothing, and I am looking at the back row as well, so <laughs> let me begin then. I want to start with a, a, a picture of the Earth from space. Now, many people have shown this image, and I still, I'm still drawn to it as an image, but why, while I'm, why I'm drawn to it is the green parts, because the green parts on there are effectively the thing that keep all of us going either through the, the, the atmospheric carbon dioxide and the drawing down of the CO2, through to the food and the, the clothes we wear. Every product has a, uh, effectively has part of a plant in it. So the overarching question that we're all, ta we're all tackling right now is how do we maintain resource security and supply, particularly of those green parts, going forwards with climate change and increasing population size and also uh, disease. So the first question then we need to ask in here is what are the main climatic drivers of the health of that vegetation, the vegetation productivity? So this is work that's been going on in my in lab in Oxford but also at, at Kew. And these are Earth's, Earth's observations. We've been using satellite imagery on a monthly basis for the last 14 years. So you've got a massive data set at five kilometre grid square. And the first thing we're looking at is What's changing, or what is the predominant vegetation driver to cause the greenness that you see? And so, the, first of all, I want to add the white parts. There is no or very little relationship between climate and vegetation, They're the deserts or the ice uh, poles. But as you'll see, water, for a lot of it, is really important. Other parts, especially up as you move further north towards the Arctic, it's the temperature. And then, interestingly, I think, cloudiness is a very important variable for much of the tropical rainforest. That's the first part of it, but the next part is, once you've got that measure of climate, then how does the vegetation <coughs> respond to it? So for every month, when you hit that vegetation with a climatic perturbation, does it stay the same or does it change? Because if it changes, it's less resilient to the climatic extremes you're putting upon it. So that's exactly the question we asked. For the 15, 14 years of data, we looked at the variation in the, in the vegetation and the variation in the climatic parameter to say, the minute you hit it, does it change or does it stay the same? And therefore, that vegetation is more resilient or less sensitive to climatic perturbations. And this is what it looks like. So this is coming out next week, but you'll see the areas in red on here, these areas are very sensitive to climate change. They have changed significantly in the last 15 years. So if you look up here at the Arctic, for example, you'll see a lot of red in here, but you'll also see other areas like the Amazon, the west coast of Africa, and parts of Australia and Indonesia. So those are areas that are effectively vulnerable, and that's where resource security is really going to be challenged by climate change in the forthcoming years. Um, we've got some red ones in here. But the flip side of that is there are some other areas across the globe where the resource security doesn't change despite equally large climate changes. So these areas here, parts of uh, this area in Australia, um, and this area here. Now this is interesting. This is one of the most heavily, one of the most important agricultural landscapes. And yet whatever's going on there, the vegetation productivity has remained relatively unscathed by the climate change that's been going on. And we'll see other areas, parts of the, um, South America in there, and also uh, South America, uh, Central America. 
So that's the starting point. But then what you need to say is, OK, we have the climate perturbation and we have vegetation sensitivity, and that leads to resource security and supply. But that's just giving you a framework. The question you then need to be asking is, well, why? Why is it that some areas are more resilient to climate change than others? And there are three, I think there are three key re reasons why this is the case. The first is it could be the way that they're managing the land. So in fact, it's not good news because they're totally stripping all the water resources in order to maintain the crops and the high productivity. That would be one, one scenario. Or it could be very good governance, very good land stewardship. The second one is that it's the abiotic features, things like the soils, the local temperatures and the pH. But the third one is, and probably the one that certainly most biologists and most people would think has a very strong influence upon resilience of vegetation, it's the biotic features. So things like the species diversity, the genetic diversity, and also the traits of the plants. And it's this, this area I want to focus on today. Because understanding these attributes is absolutely critical for going forwards, for understanding how we're going to maintain and enhance resource security and supply. So there are three, I'd say there's three key areas that people are looking or researching in to try and understand how vegetation is going to be more resilient to, to climate uh, change going forwards. The first is in terms of biodiversity, be it co populations, communities or even individual species diversity, the more diverse the landscape the, the hypothesis is the more resilient it will be because there's more copies of individuals across that landscape to withstand the climate change. So you knock something out, there's something else there to replace it. The second one is it's not to do with the biodiversity per se, it's to do with the traits of those plants. So if, if they have deep roots or they have desiccation resistant seeds, they will be more resilient and therefore it, you have to look at the traits, not necessarily the, the biodiversity per se. And the third one is it's neither of those two, or they, they both contribute, but not nearly as much as the genetic diversity and the importance of the genes. That is what really makes the difference in ordering vegetation to be resilient. And so that's really the starting point for where I want to come for my lecture. And this is, the, this is very much the, the way that I want to frame it, is starting to ask this question, how do we maintain resource <coughs> security and supply going forwards? And is polyploidy one of those answers? So, first one, what is polyploidy? <laughs> this is not an easy one. <laughs> and there are many people that when I said I was talking about polyploid, they threw their hands up in horror and said, Do you, have you read around this subject? <laughs> anyway, let's, let's go forwards on this. So I want to start with a thing that I hope everyone in the room is aware of, the human chromosome. So the human chromosome, we have in here basically 23 pairs um, of, uh, making up this overall chromosome. So, Every, every pair in here is a chromosome pair, one from the male, one from the female, um, uh, passing on into this, into this uh, overall genome. We also have the same with plants. And I should say both of these are diploid because they basically have two branches. Two, the, the, is, the chromosome is a set right the way through. So that's, that is our norm, diploid. We are diploid, many plants are diploid. If you double or triple that genome, that is a polyploidy. Now, let me explain that. Now, this is the way that, actually, I have to say my 17-year-old daughter described it to me, which I thought was a perfect way of describing it, so I'm going to pass it on to you as well. So she said, if you take a shopping basket, your shopping basket is the nucleus of your cell, and you have a shopping list. The shopping list is your genome. And so you go around the shop, and you get two of, every, two of everything, two toothpaste, two oranges, two packets of tea, whatever. You bring it back, you put that in the basket, that's your genome, that's your diploid. If you then go around the shop again with your shopping list and get all the same things again and put those in the basket, you have a whole genome duplication. And the more times you go around the shop and collect that list and put it in the shopping basket, the, you basically increase your ploidy level. So, here we have um, the, the, the official definition, polyploidy, the possession of, of more than two copies of each chromosome. And so this one here would be a diploid, so it's got one set of chromosomes. But if you wanted to make it a tetraploid, you'd have, add another full set of chromosomes. That's a tetraploid. 
Third one would be a hexaploid, so that basically you've got six, uh, three sets of chromosomes. And finally, your octoploid, where four sets of chromosomes. But this can go on and on and on. And so some of the really big plants have 35 sets of chromosomes. Absolutely huge. Why does it occur? Well, there's two ways it can occur, or two main driving mechanisms, and it can, both of it is to do with the cell division and replication. And it's effectively a mistake, either in mitosis or meiosis. So the, the, the most common one is in meiosis, which is this one here on the right. So basically, you have a form formation. This is your, basically the formation of your sex cells. And because it's the sex cells, the role is the half the number, then it goes on to basically when you uh, reproduce, then the, the two are joined together. So your end point in here is that you should have, you start off with one cell with four um, chromatids in here, and then you basically end up with two at the end of that process. But if you have a mistake at this point, when you have a reduction, that, there's supposed to be cell division and reduction in here. Sorry, my daffodils are getting in the way. Move those out of the way there. If you have a mistake, what happens then at that point in this one is that instead of reducing, they don't reduce, and so you end up with the wrong number. You should have two in there, and in fact, you've got four in those cells. In mitosis, it's this point. It's the spindle that's the problem. So normally, the spindle pulls the chromosomes apart. They line up, and here's the chromosomes here, and then you basically you have the same number because you're, you're just duplicating your cell. But what happens here is that the, although they get pulled apart, the cell doesn't, in fact, divide. So you're just left with the wrong number again. You're left with eight in there instead of four. So why am I talking about polyploidy? Well, actually, it's incredibly common in plants in particular. Many of our plants are thought to have occurred as a result of deep time polyploidy events. Um, currently, about 30 to 40% of flowering plants are polyploidy. Over 90% of our ferns are polyploid and 15% of our gymnosperms. It's not so common in animals. Um, invertebrates, you find things like the bush cricket and the, the pine uh, sawfly. But you also you do find polyploidy in freshwater fish in particular. Salmon um, is, is one, but also the goldfish. So the next time you look at your goldfish, think of it as a polyploidy individual. Right. So. The thing about polyploidy, first of all, I just want to give you some examples of it across the landscapes, and then we'll go on to why I'm actually talking about it and, and it, its role in terms of resilience and food security. So a really nice example is the field scabious, Nautia. And um, many of you will have seen it across the landscapes in the UK, but it's also extremely well distributed across, across Europe, throughout Europe, and also right the way down into the Mediterranean. And you've got... Uh, five, six different species that have been examined, and these species are overlapping, so many of them are growing in the same field. They're not beautifully isolated one from the other. And this study that was carried out was just, just to look at the ploidy levels of these, the, of these different species. And what they found, in fact, was that there are many, many different ploidy levels in here. So the Nautia collinia, Drymeria, and Mollis all were diploid, but then Arvensis and Arvenensis well, tetraploid, and then um, Illyrica is hexaploid. So across a landscape, you've got all the within well, between one species and one species, you've got all these different ploidy levels. Something that many of us will know very well: coffee. So the coffee we drink, coffee arabica, is a tetraploid, whereas the wild coffee is a diploid. So this is coffee arabica here. This nice busy plant here, no coffee on that. But these smaller things, this not smaller, but smaller leaf, that is a, that, that one there is, in fact, um, a, a, a diploid. This is another example of a polyploid, and um, this, is, this is the sort of a nightmare lecture example that you would never give to undergraduates, I have to say. So this was a study that's carried out by some colleagues at Kew, and it was to look at the distribution, they looked well to look at the genetic variation in sorbus across the UK landscape. So there are three main species of sorbus. There's the, the rowan, which most of us will know with the, this orangey berry. There's the white beam, and then there's a wild service tree. 
But when uh, Jaume and also Mike Faye started to look at the distribution in these, in these trees of, their, um, of their, their genetic material, they realised that the ploidy levels were all over the place. It's one of these trees that really is quite happily um, move, moves into many, many ploidy levels very quickly. So within, sorry, within the same landscape, you've got diploids, triploids, tetraploids, pentaploids. So it's one of these species that actually, and the minute it starts to hybridise, so this is the nightmare uh, slide that I'd never ever give to an undergraduate, but I will give it here now. So here are your three parents, all happily, the three uh, parent trees, all happily diploid, very stable, you think. But then when you start to look at all these other individuals across the landscape, we've got, you know, uh, five times four, four X, three X, etc., etc., and all sorts of hybridisation events going across the landscape. So this is, this is, I think, if you're thinking of sort of a spectrum, this is right out on the spectrum of a, a nightmare plant when you're thinking about polyploidy, but certainly it's, it's there. So what are the differences then between polyploid and diploid plants? And this is where it starts to become quite interesting. So if we think about our shopping basket and putting all of the ingredients in there, the more you're putting in there, the first, when, especially when they're young polyploid plants, the genome gets bigger and bigger and bigger in size because it's got more and more and more genetic material in it. So that if you look, we go back to the Nautier example, when we've got our, our uh, diploid um, Nautier here, you'll see down at the beginning here, it's quite, this is the relative genome size, it's quite small. By the time you get to a tetraploid, it's getting bigger. And by the time you're up to a hexaploid, it's a large genome. And that then comes through to plants themselves. Everything is bigger if you're a polyploid because you've got a lot more genetic material in there. And one of the things in particular that you notice, first of all, if you look at the underside of a leaf, you've got your, your stomatal cells, your guard cells, and your stomata there, which is the part used in the, the plant that uses for breathing, and taking in CO2, giving out water. And you'll see this is a, a plot of guard cell length against genome size in, and this is a, um, a, I think it's 300 angiosperms that were looked at here. And what you find, oh it's 112, sorry, and what, what you look at is as your genome gets bigger, your guard cell length gets bigger as well. And you can see it, you can see it here as well. And let me give you some examples that you'll have in your garden then. So this, I'm oh, sorry it looks a bit dead right now, let's go for this one. So this is a polyploid. And this is a, obviously a daffodil, but it, this is, you know, nice, standing upright. The reason I've got this dead-looking one is because the leaves, very, very thick leaves. The equivalent to that is this one. This is a diploid daffodil, which is very sweet. But you'll see tiny, you barely, probably can't even see from the back, tiny little um, uh, uh, flower on there. Very, very narrow, thin leaves in there. And actually, it's barely standing up. Um, it doesn't have the nice robust upright stem. Now they're not all much taller, so I want to give you another one which many of you will have seen. Sorry, I'll have to stand here. This little thing here is known as a tetote. I'm sure many of you have those. If you have pots in your garden, these are, these are the desired plants. So how do we know it's a polyploid? Well, you only have to look at how, it's, how upright it's standing. It's got a very strong, firm stem and its petal is coming out very firmly. So this, and the other thing, it's, it's very, very, it, it produces multiple flowers th throughout the, the growing season, throughout the flowering season. So not only the bigger, it can also start to affect things like the smell. And this is a really nice study on the fragrant orchid that was, uh, came out just uh, uh, late last year. And the study was done in two areas in Switzerland, where in Remigen and Dottingen, where they had, it's the same species, but it, there was a, um, a diploid and a tetraploid. So you had a, a polyploid and, a, and a, a diploid in there. So first of all, they noted, sure enough, there's a difference in the plant height. Your normal one, diploid, is short. Yeah, and your tetraploid is this taller plant here. But they wanted to see, is there any difference in the smell? Because this is the fragrant orchid. So the first thing is, how on earth do you measure smell in a flower? And we actually do this, it's something we do at Kew. 
And I thought I'd just show you a little bit of that methodology because it's something I was worrying about, about how you actually determine smell. So effectively, you have a glass chamber, which is called a floral uh, scent chamber, that you put over the, over the flower. And you suck out the smell with a pump for about 30 minutes of time. And all the volatiles, which create the smell and the terpenes, get uh, dragged up onto a, a, an absorbent mesh. And then you put the absorbent mesh into this machine, which heats it up and it releases the compounds into the, into the gas. And you use, use gas chromatography to, do, to split the compounds. And then you use a, um, a, a IPCMS here, this machine here, to actually measure the amount of compound in there and what they are. And so you end up with a plot where here you'd have the amount of floral scent, in this case the, the volatiles, and then and this, this is just an example of all the different flowers. So this is what they did with these two, with this fragrant orchid, and these two, the diploid and the polyploid. And what they found was this, that in fact the polyploid has a very different combination of floral scents in it. It smells different to the diploid. So, so what? Does that matter? Well, actually it does, because the um, scented orchid is pollinated by moths. And moths, as many of you will know, they, they pollinate at night. And they're most affected by smell, not by color, but by smell. And what they found, so in purple here are the diploid, and black are the tetraploid. And so we've got the hummingbird hawk moth and the elephant hawk moth here, the two main pollinators for this orchid. And what they found was, in fact, that it was these, the, having the, 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 diplo, the polyploid, having that, that better smell, they meant that they had more visitation rates by these moths, and that directly affected the number of fruits that were set and the success of those plants in producing the next set of seed. Right, now it's time for you to test some polyploidy and diploidy. We have strawberries here, which are being handed around. <laughs> and I hope by now you'll know which one is the diploid and which is the polyploid? Just while people are. <laughs> so. <laughs> right, I hope most people have got their strawberry now. I'll explain a bit about the strawberries while you're eating them. So the red, the large one on top, is the polyploid, and the small one is the wild strawberry, the diploid. And what we've done here, again, you can see the guard cells. So these are the actual plants that were measured. You can even see from the plant size here. Here's your tiny little diploid and a much bigger polyploid. And if you look at the, if you look at a photograph of the nucleus here, and you look at the number of chromosomes, the large strawberry you're eating has four times as many chromosomes in its nucleus as the little one you're eating. Um, so, has everyone got a strawberry now? I hope so. <laughs> Everyone's still eating, okay. <laughs> so the next thing then, to do with, and I hope when you were tasting those, I tasted one earlier, I'm not sure it quite holds with the strawberries. Do you think the smaller one is more bitter than the larger one? Much better, sweeter. Sweeter. So that's the wrong answer. <laughs> <laughs> so if we look at something like um, sugar beet, for example, what do you find with sugar beet is it, it has larger roots, but it maintains the same sugar content. And so the triploid sugar beet, in fact, is much more productive per unit area because it's got so much more sugar within the plant. Now, a very nice example of this. I don't know how many of you use stevia. I see Tate and Nile now have stevia in their sugar. So they, they basically have the sugar and they have stevia. So stevia is a plant compound that, um, a, a plant that has very, very sweet leaves. And that's used to enhance the sugar content. So not only do Tatel Nile now put it in their sugar, you also find it in Tesco's milk chocolate, I found. 
tomato ketchup, the one that's got the blue label around the edge, and they say it's half the sugar, it's because they've flavoured it with, with this plant, with stevia. Also, the green Coke, the green Coca-Cola, is also flavoured by that. I always wonder what was in that. So, that's what the plant looks like, uh, stevia rebudiana, it's diploid. But in this very nice uh, experiment, what they did, they used the, they, they synthetically induced polyploidy using colchicine, which is actually a, pro, uh, it's a, it's a chemical compound from the crocus. Anyway, that does induce polyploidy. And what they found, first of all, the plant was much bigger. So this is your polyploid and this is your diploid in here. But also, they found you got a two times increase in the um, stevial glycosides, which are the compounds that make it sweeter so that you're actually increasing in that, in that one plant, increasing its ability and its, its sweetness. Some many examples that we have, have in here, I won't go through all of them, but up, up to 50% of the crops we eat, for example, are polyploid. Um, and that includes things like the bread wheat, potatoes, um, oats, and things like the yams as well. But it's not just the food we eat, it's also in the pharmaceutical industry. If you look at something like the Iranian poppy, the polyploid plants have this increased quantities of alkaloids per unit weight. So it's really important for things like morphine production. And common mint is another one. You get higher levels of oil. And again, the, the, um, the in increased terpene levels. And then two last examples in here. We've got the cotton has a higher fibre content, the textural cotton. And the, we look at rapeseed oil, you've got this expansion of your oil biosynthesis gene. And so therefore you have much higher quality and quantity of the oil. Now, baked beans. I was hoping I was going to be able to give a really good story on baked beans here, but very sadly, they're diploid. <laughs> However, we can have soybeans and we can also have peanuts, which are alone a billion dollar industry every year. Although I was, when I looked at this the other day, I was slightly relieved to find that this is the year, the inter 2016 is the International Year of the Pulses. <laughs> so we're sort of in the right, the right territory. But it's not just about the quality and the quantity and the taste, which you've all had a sample of, of the produce. I want to bring us back to this whole question of resilience that I talked about at the beginning. Because you've got greater genetic material in a cell. So does that therefore give the plant greater plasticity? Is it more able to cope with environmental perturbations? Those areas that you can see that don't really react to climate change in the last 15 years, have they got a higher number of polyploids on the landscape? So that was one of the, that's, that's another really big question about polyploids. Because we do know from the fossil record that times of really catastrophic environmental change, you get an increase in the number of polyploids. So here we have, this is the lineages of major flowering plants, and this is a major ca catastrophic period in Earth's history at the, at the <coughs> Cretaceous tertiary boundary. It's when we had meteorites hitting the Earth, we had extreme volcanism going on, super plumes into the atmosphere, completely changing the environmental picture. We also saw the end of the dinosaurs, or many, many, many groups of the dinosaurs went at that point. The green lineage splits in there, all of those are major polyploid events. And so one of the questions is, or one of the, the, what's been put forward, the idea or the hypothesis is that the reason you see all the polyploids coming in at that point is because they're more resilient to those environmental extremes that are going on. So what about recent records then? So I've got another food example, two more food examples actually. These are kiwi, the, known as the Chinese gooseberry. We actually, there are three that are, com oh, sorry, three that are commercially explored or exploited. This one, is, I think the one that we all know, um, which is the um, chinensis, uh, Veris deliciosa. Then we have this one here, this sort of yellowy orange one. And then we have Actinidia chinensis Veris chinensis. So this one is polyploid, these two are diploid. So what they did was, they, this is a very nice study in central west China, they looked at where these things grew on the landscape. So do you see a difference in terms of the growth of the, the distribution across the landscape according to whether or not they're polyploid or diploid? And sure enough, what they found was, that, oh, that what they found were the hexaploids were growing up here in the mountains where you get much greater variation in climate and uh, climate and climatic extremes. And down in the Hunan foothills where it's much more placid the climate, you've got the, the diploids and some of the tetraploids. 
So in that example, it would seem to suggest there is some resilience trait within that polyploid, within those polyploids. Potatoes is the other one. There's not many studies that have been done on food crops. Potatoes is the other one. You can, th so here we've got the Solanum tuberosum, which is the um, antigeum group, so basically with the ones that grow down the, the west coast of um, South America. The diploids, so you just can eyeball this, the diploids have a, a, a reasonable distribution. The triploids are not so great. We'll come on to that later. But look at the tetraploids. There's much, much wider variation. So therefore, crossing a much greater climatic extreme in here. But not all features are polyploid. When we've had the strawberries, we've, I've shown you the bigger plants, not all features are particularly beneficial. Many of the traits that make polyploids really successful also make them very successful invasive plants if they're in the wrong place. So this, um, these are the, the percentage amongst the most widespread invasive species. Those in green are diploid, those in black are polyploid. So they're split into uh, family groups. So this is grasses, uh, Fabaceae, um, Asteraceae, etc. The only one where you don't actually have any polyploids is in, the, is in Pinaceae. But I'm going to give you two examples. I think you'll probably all of you would have encountered at least one of these invasives in the last, uh, last year. The first one is the Japanese knotweed. I'm sure most people have that somewhere near them in their garden. So this is the distribution of Japanese knotweed now across the UK. Not good. It was first introduced as a, as a nice plant to the UK in 1825, but very deep roots, very vigorous growth, when you get Japanese knotweed on your landscape or in your garden, you can lose up to 80% of your other plants because it shades everything else out. It's so vigorous. So much so that I found that actually if you want to have a survey done of your house, you have to declare Japanese knotweed if it's in the garden. And also that in Australia, it's illegal to have knotweed growing in your garden. Although I don't know how many of you tried to get rid of it because I'm not quite sure how easy that's going to be in that case. The other one is Lantana camerata. This is it's basically where it is presently. Um, and again, it has these very high ploidy levels, very, very happily will invade anything. The worst thing about this is that it basically, it totally obliterates any grazing land. So it's very, very hard to maintain cattle. I'm afraid the botanic gardens are at fault here. It was first introduced to India and Australia and also South Africa in the botanic gardens <coughs> as a very nice plant because it has a very pretty flower but it got out, out of the gates and that was the end of it. And as we know, it's now a huge problem. The other thing about, or a disadvantage, could be a disadvantage of being polyploid, is that the bigger the, green, the genome size, the more vulnerable you are to extinction. And it's, this is possibly or probably something to do with the time it takes to replicate because you've got so much genetic material that it becomes more and more hard to basically to, to reproduce. So this is work done by Ilya Lich, Lich who is our, well, our senior research leader at Kew. And so um, certainly any questions on this, they must be directed back to Ilya, who is in the audience. But you'll see here that we can go to really, really obese genome sizes right the way up, the, the, up here. But um, things like Fritillaria have got a really large large genome size in there. And sure enough, when you look at, so I've got the example we've taken from the, the IUCN red list of threatened species. There's one for orchids, which is led by another Q scientist, Mike Fay. And if you look at the number of threatened and highly threatened orchids on the red list and their genome size, you find most of them have a really big genome size. So it does seem to influence their, or the, the way their threat levels according to their genome size. And another example, this is another example, a tree that was actually first, it was first described by John Dransfield, which is head of plant research in 1989. It's one of the rarest of rare palms ever. This one is about four individuals left in the wild in Madagascar. It's, it's known as the, um, uh, the, the forest coconut. It's got these extraordinary fruits on it. Um, 38 duplicate sets of chromosomes. Massive, absolutely massive. Right, the other problem is that if you're a polyploid and you're a triploid, then you're infertile. Now, what is a triploid? Let me just go back to the shopping basket example because that's, again, the easiest way. So you've filled your basket with your genome, which is your diploid. To be a triploid, you'd go around the supermarket, but instead of collecting two of everything, you'd only collect one. And as a result of that, 
you can't, it, you basically, you've become infertile. So what's missing then in this? Seeds. And that's the problem. So I'll give you an example in here. So there's no seeds, which actually is quite nice. It's not a problem, but it's a problem for the plant. Um, <laughs> OK, so this is these. I'm not sure I can cut these up. I'll try. This is our common banana that we all happily eat our way through. And I think what you'll realise, if I can cut it up, is that you can't see any seeds in there at all. Right? This sad-looking thing here is the diploid equivalent from the glass house at Kew today. And I cut one up earlier because I believe me, you need a hacksaw. And those are the seeds in it. Now, if anyone wants to try this afterwards, you're extremely welcome, but mind your teeth. Because apparently it can, these seeds can, it can break the teeth, but that, that, that is a diploid, that's the seed of a banana. And so, therefore, you really need, if, you've, if, you're a, if you are a triploid, if triploid plant, the sugar beet, I get the example, like that's a triploid as well, then you, most often, you can reproduce vegetatively, but most often it will require a particular, it will require human um, intervention in there. And the, the last point, really, is that although we've got all these polyploids and we, all of our 50% of our crops are polyploids, most of them have gone through an incredible ge genetic bottlenecking over the time since they were first domesticated. So if we take uh, wheat, for example, it was, it was first dom domesticated in the Near East, in the Fertile Crescent, 10,000 years ago. So it's gone through this massive genetic bottlenecking and lost many of the genes and traits that make it resilient to, or could make it resilient to climate change. So, where are then the future research avenues for polyploid plants? How can we take the beneficial parts that we know about and start to breed them into plants for the future to create more resilient um, resource security and supply? Well, we really need to return to the wild, I would say, to start with. And that is the collecting of the crop wild relatives. Because the crop wild relatives contain the genetic, they, they, they haven't gone through that genetic bottlenecking. And there's plenty of, plenty of work going on, including some at Kew, of collecting crops, um, the wild crop relatives from uh, known areas across the world. And for example, in Kew, we've got 20% of the world's wild crop relatives already stored in the Millennium Seed Bank. But before you can collect them, I know it's like some bit, a bit naive, but before you can collect them, you need to know where they are, and you also need to know how many there are out there. And so that's another really important thing, is identifying and locating, identifying them. So we've got two examples here. This is one of our science heads, Paul Wilkin here, holding a, uh, that, that he works on yams, and this was a, a new species of yam that was discovered last October in Madagascar. Another uh, piece of work done by Q scientists, this is coffee. And so Q's been very heavily involved in these, the coffee species. You can come look at them later, but the, the, all these different coffee plants at the front here. And <coughs> if, you, if we just look at the number of species of coffee, in 1985, when I uh, finished my undergraduate degree, we only knew of 40 species of coffee in the wild. We now know of 125. So there's a huge increase in the number of species of coffee. And in there, we will find ones that are more resilient. For example, there's this one. This is the largest known coffee bean from Madagascar, and it grows in environments of up to nearly 40 degrees C. And it was discovered in 2009. So there still is a really important place in science for this basic discovery and identification. But for me, I think this is one of the, one of the sort of important um, points, because we have, we have the Genome Size Database at Q, And I thought, well, OK, if we're saying polyploidy is an important trait for resilience, for all the things that we've seen and heard about and tasted, then how many of our crop wild relatives have we measured their genome size so far and know about their ploidy levels? And actually, I found that only 2.5% of all known crop wild relatives do we have any genome size or ploidy data on. So that's clearly a gap in our knowledge and one that needs to be, um, needs to be filled quickly. And the other thing that we really need to know, another knowledge gap, and really the final point I want to make, is the one about the trade-off between resilience and um, vulnerability. Because I've said that polyploids, because of their very nature, can be resilient, but I've also said when the genome size gets too big, they actually, they, they, it becomes a vulnerability trait rather than a resilience trait. 
And so we did some very um, some modelling this week to look at this. So we, when we held genome size constant and looked at ploidy level, so these are the different, these are the red list status, so least concern, vulnerable, endangered, critically endangered. As you increase the ploidy level, basically the plants become effectively more resilient. They're, they're stronger. They, you have less on the critically endangered. If you hold, however, if you hold ploidy level constant and look at genome size, as you increase your genome size, they become more threatened. So what in fact you're seeing is if we've got resilience and climate perturbations, what we're saying is if you're increasing numbers of whole, whole genome, that should lead to a more resilient crop. However, if your genome size gets too big, then that actually has the opposite effect. So what we really need to find is that threshold point where the plant effectively switches from being a resilient plant to being a vulnerable plant and more, um, more at risk of climate change. So just some concluding remarks then in there. Polyploidy is, is a naturally occurring phenomenon. It's something that's been going on throughout Earth's history and is still going on. And if you take sorbus as an example, it, I'm sure with the, if it went back and measured tomorrow, you'd find there are even more ploidy levels across the UK landscape. But the, and the consequences of this whole genome du duplication has been really, really, it's had a profound impact on our on many food and non-food crops. And I think most people don't realise when they're using these products, actually what they're actually eating or what they're using is in fact from a polyploid plant. So it's really critical that we start to look for the polyploids of the future and look for those in things like the crop wild relatives. And we do need to understand both the trade-offs and the traits in there. But I would argue that polyploids could be an important get out of jail card when we're, when we're thinking about resource security and, and enhancing our resource in the face of climate change because of so many of those traits that we already use on a daily basis. So, thank you. Thank you for that very illuminating lecture. Um, I'm sure Kathy will be willing to answer questions. And perhaps I'll ask uh, the first one, which is this trade-off between vulnerability and resilience. I, I can sort of understand why, if you have genome duplication, you could have resilience, because you could have, say, multiple alleles and so on. But uh, why does it lead to vulnerability? Is that simply due to? Failure of replication? I, th I think so. I mean, I th that's that's the argument: is that when you get a really big genome size, it's so much more, it's so much slower <laughs> to replicate that it makes it a, a yes, just a much slower process. Okay. Well, um, that flows. Yeah. Could you please wait for the microphone? This somebody in the front here. There. Thank you. That was a beautiful lecture. Absolutely perfect. I was wondering if you can learn anything from the giant redwood trees, like the General Sherman trees in America. Yes, it's an interesting one because they are polyploid, as, 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 you, know, as you probably know. Uh, so they are, they're an interesting one because they, they are one of the fastest growing um, species on the planet as well. Um, and I just don't think they've been studied in that, in, that, in that sense, but I think they would be a really interesting one to be looking at because they clearly are also remarkably resilient given how long they've been around for and maintained and gone through so many climatic uh, changes over the last two, three thousand years. The person over there. Uh, you said that, that uh, triploids can be sort of induced to reproduce. Mm. Um, could you say how that's done if they're not producing seeds? Oh, so it's vegetative reproduction, basically clonal growth. So basically, it, it will be, yes, it, just through a vegetative process, that's how they will reproduce. So you certainly, you, yeah. Does that answer the question? I'm not sure what you mean by vegetative. Uh, right. <laughs> okay, so um, basically, it's, it's uh, reproduction through um, just uh, 
Oh, God, I'm not sure how I can describe it. You've, basically, you don't have a male and female plant. You will just have a part will grow off, off from the plant and then eventually it becomes an independent plant. It, it basically splits off that way. So it's, it's, a, it's in, a, in a sense, what you're ending up with is... Um, oh, what's the word? Uh, clones. Clones. <laughs> okay, so you end up with clones, all the clones, all the same. And of course, that then brings a risk in itself because they're all, of, they're all effectively identical. And so then you have that big risk, disease comes along, you've wiped out your entire triploid population. As with the bananas. As with bananas, exactly. I, hi, over here. I, I uh, wondered, is there any reason or any understanding of why it's so much more common in plants than in animals? Um, I, I, I don't know. I'm looking at some of my colleagues who would, might be able to answer that. Is there um, uh, Mike Fay from Q? Maybe he can answer that one, actually, <laughs> if that's okay. <laughs> Hand it over. Well, one of the reasons which has been suggested is that most plants don't have sex chromosomes, and many animals do, and sex chromosomes define sex on the basis of a ratio between them. So we, we either have two X chromosomes or one X and one Y. But if humans went to a polyploid level and they had three sex chromosomes or four, then that balance is broken down. In, with plants not, in most cases, having sex chromosomes, then it gives them that degree of freedom. OK, thank you for that, Mike. <laughs> Stepping in. There's a question here in front. Thank you for a very illuminating lecture. As an engineer, can I ask whether there's ever going to be the possibility of engineering that transition from one to the other? And I was wondering, if it's going on in the world right now, mm. are there certain places we'd look for that transition in real time? For example, in the uh, environs of Chernobyl or something. Could it be, you know, what is it that would yeah. allow that transition? So to that's occur? a really interesting question. I mean, one, you know, what drives something to go from a diploid to a polyploid in a natural environment? If you go up in a mountain, the higher you get, the normally the higher the number of polyploids. And one of the arguments is that actually it's higher UVB causing mutation and that in itself leads to a polyploid coming through. No one's really looked in detail on a global scale to say, you know, is there a relationship between UV, UV, UVA or B and polyploid? But I think it would be a really interesting one to look at because, of course, the time you see all those polyploids coming in at the, at the Cretaceous tertiary boundary is when they also had a really big spike of UV. Yeah, could I, could I follow up on that? I, I, I loved your example of the orchid, where the polyploid variety smelled yeah. more strongly. Yeah. Um, but for some strange reason, polyploidy has affected just one set of genes, yeah. and it's that the, the generate the, the scent. Yes. And it's those genes that are important. So my question to you yeah. is, why should we be focusing on polyploidy, wouldn't it be much better to use genetic engineering mm. to simply amplify those specific genes? And then you get all the benefits, mm. the improved smell, but you don't get the disadvantages the of, of polyploidy. Um, I think, I mean, I think there's, there's a lot in that, and I think, I think you're right. I think that the, but the first point, the first part of that is that it's the it's the polyploid, it, the fact that this polyploid has shown that differential expression of that gene that brings about the change in smell. But also, the other thing with polyploids is it affects many, many parts of the plant, so that if you look at it overall as a trait, rather than as an individual, what its individual gene um, expression is, then the overall package is what I think is often what is required in, the, in, the, in a polyploid. So if I look at the daffodils, you know, it's the fact you've got the thicker leaves, the, the nicer flowers, the taller plant. All of, if you try to do that through genetic engineering, I think that would take an awful lot of time, whereas the fact that it's a bit of a hodgepodge in there, it's all these multiple copies of genes, some are differentially expressed. So I, I think there's, there's space for both, actually, is probably the answer that I put in there. So, but I do agree that there are, there are times when a 
genetic modification would be the right one. Um, you, you focused a lot on the fitness of individuals mm. as a result of if they're polyploids or diploids, but I'm curious from ecosystems are made up of big networks of individuals, mm. and I'm curious if the most robust eco ecosystems, is it necessarily all polyploids, or is there actually some optimal balance where you have a mixture of that? That, I mean, that's a really interesting question, which I just don't know the answer to. I don't think people have looked at the landscape scale of the relationship between polyploids and diploids. I think most of the studies to date have been done on the individuals. But uh, you know, if you take that resilience map, for example, and took it down to a granular scale of, I mean, we can get that down to like 30 metres, could you then start to look across landscape saying, do you have a higher percentage of polyploids on this landscape or is it, a, is it a combination? I just don't know the answer, but it's a really good question. And just one, one more thing. How did you define resilience in that map that you showed at the start? I mean, what, how did you define that? So th what we were doing, we looked at, so every, every pixel that was there, we had vegetation productivity over 15 years, monthly, uh, so monthly variation, and you had uh, a climatic perturbation, be it temperature, precipitation, or, or cloudiness. And effectively, we were looking at the variation in the two over the 15 years. And those, those pixels where you had maximum variation in climate, yet your vegetation remained unchanged, so the vegetation is more persistent despite climatic perturbation, we would say is a measure of resilience. There's also the phenomenon of hybrid, hybridity causing an yes. increase of bigger, of course. Yes. How does this uh, fit in with the polyploidy? If you produce polyploid hybrids, are they more vigorous still? Um, <laughs> yes. So, in the, in the, in the Nightmare Sorbus example, um, a lot of that in there was, uh, it was a polyploidy, uh, the different polyploids, and then hybridization as well. So yes, I mean, plants are very promiscuous and they quite happily hybridise as well. So therefore, you can add all sorts of different combinations in there. I don't know if they're more resilient, more robust, but certainly um, hybridisation is something, and hybrids have been things that have been created throughout, you know, the minute humans got their hands on plants, really. And that's, you know, that's also true. If you, you probably could do the same, start to look at this whole question of hybridisation in addition to poly, polyploids. So perhaps we can take There's a, a couple of last front. questions. There are some questions in the front here. Hello. You showed us a goldfish. Mm. Uh, could, you, could you wait for the mic, please? I think you showed us a goldfish uh, that was uh, polyploid. I presume they can suffer the same genetic bottlenecks or whatever as plants. But you, your lecture was entirely after that talking about plants. Is there something special about genetic bottlenecks in plants that uh, can't occur in humans or animals? Or? Um, I mean, I was mainly talking about plants, but only because that's where my own expertise is and being based at Kew. Um, but, but actually, there is, there is a fish specialist here, Peter Holland, who I see is in there, who works on polyploiding fish. So I think that, that's the conversation for afterwards with him. But certainly, I think it'd be, there's some interesting questions there about why you have polyploid particular groups of fish that are polyploids as well. Interesting, you have a human. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> They'd be dead, sadly. <laughs> well, I'm afraid there'll be lots more questions, and Kathy will be around for some, some time later this evening. And so um, uh, we'll have to uh, bring this to a close now. And so I'd like to present her with the Fantastic. certificate and the medal and, and the chat. Thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you for a really wonderful. Yeah.